And I don't, if, if you don't know who I am, I am, um, my title is Program Director for Aquatic Ecosystems Extension. So I, I work for Ohio State University Extension. I'm based at the School of Environment and Natural Resource on, uh, on main campus. And my appointment statewide. I do pond stuff statewide. By training, I'm a fisheries biologist and I'm kind of the state's official pond guy. I help folks manage ponds. And I know that in, in email, Brady asked you to mute uh, while you're just sitting in the background, and I do appreciate that. However, if you have a question, feel free to unmute and then ask that question and then re-mute yourself again. Uh, I'd rather interact if at all possible rather than just talk to a plastic box. So even though it's still a plastic box as a go-between, I prefer your direct interaction than just talking to the plastic box. Uh, that helps me imagine that there are real people out there. So um, this is a presentation I duked up a few years ago on, at the request actually of uh, Portage and um, Geauga counties. Uh, they do joint pod clinics every other year. They asked me to kind of put together my top five inquiries, which is a really good way to kind of give an overview of those things that I address most often when I talk about ponds. So here it is. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to refer you to some references. This first one, the Ohio Pond Management Handbook, you can pick this up in hard copy at any of the local Division of Wildlife offices, or uh, you can download it for free. There's the link there. Um, and it's a really great overview regarding a little bit about everything related to pond management. Now, it goes into really good detail on managing pond fisheries. The other topics it only kind of touches on. Uh, but if you've got a question about ponds and how to manage them, this is a really good place to start. Now, don't bother writing down all of these very complicated web links. Um, the one that you probably should make note of is my email address, because if you want any of this stuff, just make note of what it is and write to me and I'll get it to you. Um, also, I do believe that um, Brady is recording the meeting. So you can refer to it at your leisure later. Don't feel obliged to, to try to frenziedly scratch down all of these complicated links. Now, if you have detailed questions about a specific topic, we had an old, a suite of old fact sheets that were really good and went in tremendous detail, but they're old now and they have old logos. I am working to write new ones, but it's only me and so it takes some time, but I've kept all those old fact sheets uh, in electronic form. And if you've got a question and you call me and we talk about it, I will get a copy of those old fact sheets to you because they still have good information that can be used. Uh, recently, because of COVID, uh, when I wasn't sitting in my office to tend to my phone, I, I instituted these weekly office hours. So this happens every Tuesday afternoon from four to six. If you ever have a, a pond question from four to six on a Tuesday afternoon, you can click this link and visit my, my virtual Zoom space. It'll look very much like this. And then you and I can talk directly about any pond issues you might have. You can show me pictures. You can carry your portable device out and show me what's happening in real, in real time. Um, feel free to make use of my virtual office hours that again happen every Tuesday afternoon. Uh, you do write occasional newsletter articles, and those are posted to the page that you see linked there. And finally, I also maintain a listserv. So if you'd like to get some periodic notifications about pond doings around the state, feel free to sign up for that listserv. Um, emails to that listserv are spotty, right? Sometimes there's, there's a wealth of them as I'm getting new events booked, and sometimes it's slow. But uh, join that listserv if you'd like to get that information. Eugene. Yeah, go ahead. This is Bill Hobbles. So can I have permission to record this? Please. I thought that you'd already begun recording. So go right ahead and record. So um, where did this presentation come from? So uh, depending on the year, I get about 250 to 300 uh, inquiries related to pond management in any given year. And I keep record of them and I tend to categorize them, right? So. You'll note that the title is top five pond inquiries, or is that seven? Well, that's because if I stretch out that number to seven, I managed to capture the top five inquiries in any given year. And here you'll see where I have uh, the percentage 
so, well, first off, you'll see this first column has the topic, the general topic. Uh, then we have by year, uh, each number in these cells represents a percentage, right? So there you go. Um, in any given year, I'm going to get, say, 15 to 20 percent of the inquiries I take are going to be about managing plants and ponds, et cetera, et cetera. And I've only pre presented numbers for the top five in every given year. So you can see, once again, if I stretch out the number to seven, uh, we managed to capture the top five of all of the recent years where I've been actually uh, documenting and keeping some records. So here are a handful of topics that are good topics that I often get inquiries about, but that didn't quite make the cut. Invasive species, construction or dredging, uh, leaks or erosion, persistent muddy water. And recently I've had a, a, an odd spate of questions about specifically euglena blooms, which is an algae-like thing that can free, freely swims around and it tends to turn red under sunlight. Uh, but these are things that didn't quite make the cut. Still, if you've got questions about them, feel free to, to keep those questions in mind and ask those questions as we get to the end of the presentation. What I will cover today, uh, so first you'll see the topic and then you'll see how I've ranked it overall given the span of the last several years. Managing aquatic plants is number one almost always. So that's uh, the top, uh, the most inquiries I get are about managing plants and ponds. Next comes filamentous green algae. Harmful algal blooms varies a lot from year to year, depending on the year. Some year really produces a lot and some years fewer, but they are often on people's minds because they're potentially toxic. Fisheries management, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Fish kills, wild aquatic organisms that uh, kind of voluntarily recruit to your pond. And finally, this catch-all category, this general pond or lake management, where if I've got a conversation that touches on lots of things or something that I'm just not quite sure how to categorize, it kind of falls into there. So let's first start, start talking about managing aquatic plants. And uh, the essence of managing aquatic plants successfully is begin by preventing them from becoming a problem. So start, if you haven't built the pond yet, Start by planning to build the pond to minimize the likelihood that plants become problems. So you start by planning that depth to about eight feet maximum and ideally about 25% of the pond's area will be to eight feet deep or deeper and a slope of about three to one uh, from the shoreline. So as you step out three feet from the shore, you're going down about a foot in depth, okay? And so that's a nice relatively steep slope to a decent, bottom depth. And the idea is to put the bottom out of reach of the sunlight because the sun doesn't penetrate that well into the water to make it less likely that plants can grow. Now, of course, that's going to vary a whole lot depending upon the clarity of your pond. And we can talk about managing that later. But in essence, enough depth and, an, and a steep enough slope to, to kind of minimize the ring around the perimeter to the depth of which plants can grow. Manage nutrients proactively. And uh, I often talk about the difference between external and internal sources of nutrients, right? So externally, for example, fertilizing the watershed of the pond with a lawn fertilizer that has phosphorus is generally a bad idea, okay? So <laughs> uh, look at the watershed, look for potential sources of nutrients and manage to minimize the flow of nutrients from the landscape into the pond. Uh, internally, if ponds, stratify strongly, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, and lose oxygen from the deep water, they will recycle especially phosphorus from the deep water, right? So you can manage that over time, and we'll talk about, about that in more detail on one of the later sections. If plants, you've built your pond correctly, uh, you see that plants are getting out of hand one year, the next year maybe apply a dye to further limit the penetration of sunlight into the water, right? So you dye the water, uh, sunlight can't penetrate as deeply, you're helping to manage against aquatic plants. Now, dyes are a preventative measure. So you're going to want to apply a dye early in the season before stuff starts to grow, uh, which is going to typically be before now even. Uh, so very often in March, sometimes even in February, uh, depending upon how weak the winter has been, right? If we've had a relatively weak winter, the growing season is going to start on your pond much sooner. 
Some people will even apply a dye to the ice and allow the melting of ice to disperse the, the dye into the pond. Now, dyes have some limitations, right? Uh, they work best uh, in ponds that have good depth, right? Because there's more of the water column above that bottom to shade. So ponds that have good depth and that retain water for a long period of time. So if you've got a lot of flow through your pond, if your pond loses a lot of water in the springtime, if water is leaving the pond, it's carrying dye with it, right? So you're going to get the best benefit for a dye from ponds that are relatively deep and that hold their water for a relatively long amount of time. I always argue for tolerance of at least some vegetation in the pond. Right? So plants growing in the pond, I'm talking about stuff that's growing mostly under the water, will provide beneficial competition against things that can become real nuisance organisms and serves as valuable habitat. Right? So any plants that are growing are consuming nutrients, they're occupying space, and that means that they're taking nutrients and space away from things like filamentous green algae, or they're taking nutrients away from potentially <clears throat> harmful algal bloom organisms. So Tolerating some coverage of plants provides benefit in improving water quality. If you want to experiment with tolerating plants in your pond, though, you have to have two considerations that I think are important. And that be that those species are diverse, that you've got a good mixture of different types of plants, and that they be native plants only, okay? So one of the issues is if it's, if it's a plant that has colonized this region because it is from someplace else, and an invasive species, it's an aggressive colonizer, right? And so if we have an aggressive colonizer, like for example, curly leaf pondweed is a good, is a good example. It's a, it's a non-native pondweed. We've got lots of native pondweeds here that are fine, but curly leaf pondweed is an aggressive colonizer. It's an invasive species. And let's say it gets into your pond, it outcompetes all the other plants, it chokes out all the other plants, so all you have left is curly leaf pondweed, right? Now curly leaf pondweed is a notorious early season grower. So it takes over your pond, it grows early in the season, and it dies late in the summer or early in the fall and becomes a liability as it's decomposing and releasing the nutrients and consuming oxygen through decomposition, you've lost any benefit it was providing to the pond and that, that plant has become a liability, right? So you don't wanna tolerate invasive species and you want a mix of species. So let's say you've got the native pond weeds with a mix of some elodia and some naiads and other things, right? As the pond weeds die back, then the naiads and the elodia are growing up to replace them so that you have benefit from plants throughout the growing season. Depending upon your goals for the fishery, I usually recommend that you begin experimenting with about 5 to 20 percent of the area being vegetated, about 5 to 20 percent. Now that's really a grossly general rule of thumb because every pond is going to be a little bit different, but it's a good starting place. Um, higher within that range, so let's say up to the 20 percent coverage of plants, will provide better benefits to water quality, uh, make the water more clear, for example. Uh, and provide better benefits to fish survival. Lower within that range will provide benefits to fish mortality and growth, right? So it makes, makes hunting easier for fish, which uh, means you're going to have fewer fish, but they'll be bigger. And we'll talk a lot more about that later, how that works. So if it's not important for your pond to produce fish at all, you can tolerate more vegetation. Right, so I doubt that's the case here though. If it is with anybody, let me know, but you can tolerate a lot more vegetation if it's not important for you to produce catchable fish. The drawback though is excessive coverage will contribute to wide oxygen fluctuations and can stunt fish, right? Because plants are photosynthesizers. Uh, so if you don't know what that means, I'm pretty sure all of you probably do, but let me quickly explain when the sunlight is shining on plants, right? They have chlorophyll, which makes them green. They absorb the energy from the sun. They absorb some carbon dioxide and they use that to manufacture sugars for their own metabolism. Uh, a byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen. They give off oxygen when they are photosynthesizing. So in the daytime, when the sunlight is shining on plants and they are photosynthesizing to make sugars, they're producing oxygen. However, as it becomes dark, uh, of course it does this every night, but even extended cloud cover can reduce photosynthesis to the point that it becomes problematic 
um, plants are respiring as well, right? They're functionally breathing. So they're also taking in oxygen. So when it becomes dark and photosynthesis stops, they become net consumers of oxygen. So let's say if we were to graph oxygen on your pond, sun is shining on your plants during the course of the day, the plants are making oxygen. If I were to graph that, oxygen is going up, up, up on my graph, right? Sun goes down and oxygen is getting used up by respiration, by plants breathing, by fish breathing, by everything else breathing and oxygen goes down. If you've got a good coverage of plants, you know, we do this every day. We wiggle around this happy line in the middle. Everybody can tolerate that, that's good. If we have a tremendous abundance of plants uh, in a very small volume of water, oxygen is going way up during the day, the day, sun goes down, all those plants in that small volume of water, which is a small reservoir of oxygen, consume all the oxygen and oxygen crashes every night, right? So you don't want too much vegetation. The right coverage is good. Uh, helps maintain healthy oxygen. Too much coverage leads to really wide oxygen fluctuations. Also, too much vegetation creates too many hiding places for fish. So your, your bluegill, your, your prey fish in the pond, never get eaten. So they don't die, they overpopulate. And in overpopulating, there's too much competition among each other and they can't grow, okay? So once again, too much coverage bad, the right coverage very good for the quality of your pond. The drawback, the biggest drawback is that it requires some active management and some savvy. You need to look at your pond, you need to have some sense of what vegetation you want there and you have to actively manage it to make sure it's producing the kind of coverage you want. And that is, that's hard for some people because not very few people know a lot about how to identify aquatic plants. I'm going to mention this warm water caveat often. So let me get it out of the way right now. So you'll see me talking about the warm water caveat when we're talking about treating green things, okay? And that is that, as we've discussed, green things are producing oxygen when the sun is shining on them. Well, a quirk of water and oxygen is that it's easier for water to retain dissolved oxygen when it's cold. Okay, it's not like sugar, right? With sugar, water gets warm and we can, we can dissolve it much more easily into the water. With oxygen, it's just the opposite because oxygen is very volatile. It, when the water is warm, the oxygen wants to become a gas by leaving the pond, right? So cold water is going to hold oxygen better than warm water. Plants are producing oxygen when the sun is shining on them. If we kill too much with an herbicide, when the water is very warm. That warm water is less capable of holding oxygen. We've killed plants, so they stop producing oxygen. And as those plants are decomposing, the bacteria breaking them down, that consumes oxygen, right? And so we've got this triple whammy. So if you treat too much vegetation when the water is very warm, you risk creating an oxygen crash and a fish kill, okay? So that is the warm water caveat. When that water gets warm, don't treat too much. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about that soon. Uh, if you're going to apply an herbicide, check that label. Only use herbicides that are specifically labeled for aquatic applications. Doing otherwise is putting yourself and your family and your livestock and your pets at risk. These are deliberately poisonous substances. So only use them as they've been labeled to be used. Otherwise breaks the law and creates frankly liability for yourself. So read, understand and strictly adhere to the label including any use restrictions and safety info. So whole water versus spot treatments. Uh, and that the contrast between those is a whole water treatment. You will dissolve the uh, concentration of the product into the water that will kill whatever target is uh, present to be killed uh, throughout the entirety of the water column. The time to consider whole water treatments is in the spring when that water is still cool. And because of that warm water caveat that I gave you, once that water becomes warm, we're probably talking, let's say uh, once it enters the, the, the low to mid 70 degree mark, let's say 72, 74 degrees at the surface temperature. Um, once it gets to that point, you'll only want to consider spot treatments or what they call partial treatments, depending on the label, right? Some labels will call it spot treatments. Some people will call it, some labels will call it partial treatments. But once that water becomes warm, 
only consider spot treatments. Now, spot treatments are often good if you have a desirable plant, but um, a nuisance plant next to it, you know, apply it only to that nuisance plant and, and kill it, or um, apply to small areas at a time if you want to avoid uh, an oxygen crash that would kill fish, right? So spot treatments, and it will vary, but it will be discussed on the label if it's appropriate for that. Typically, we're talking about treating a quarter to a third of the area at a time and probably spacing treatments out by two to three weeks with some variability that will be noted on the label, right? So always make sure you read and understand that label. Um, there's the difference between spot and whole water treatments. Now, there is no real pre-emergent strategy for applying an herbicide to the water. Um, aquatic herbicides are very deliberately crafted to do their business as quickly as possible and leave the water so that the water can be used um, by you for whatever you use water for. So applying an herbicide to water where the target is not yet growing is wasting your money. You have to, there are two things that you need in place before you apply an herbicide, okay? And those two things are, first, the target has to be present, at least in some concentration, even very small, it has to be at least present. And depending on the product you've chosen, they will have different effectiveness for temperatures. Uh, you have to reach that minimum effective temperature before you can apply it. But once you've reached and once you've achieved both those things, the target is present and the temperature has been reached for the product that's going to be effective for it, then you can treat. So treating early as possible, if you're aware that you have a pond that consistently produces a problem, treating as early as possible will limit the ability of those plants to grow exponentially into the future. So you, you don't have to treat nearly as much if you start early. And then finally, there are triploid grass carp, which are usually sold as white aimer because people don't like to spend money on things called carp. Um, typically they're stocked depending upon the plant and the, the amount of vegetation, of the amount of the plant present that might make a problem. We're usually talking about a stocking rate of about two to 10 fish per acre. And don't exceed that. Uh, too many people have a knee jerk reaction, right? They stock the, the appropriate number to their pond. They don't see things happening immediately because it takes some time for these juvenile, these baby grass carp to begin eating vegetation and come to an equilibrium, right? So people don't see this happening immediately because they're not an herbicide, right? And so they just throw in like three times the recommended stocking rate of grass carp. And eventually as those grass carp grow, they have just a scoured muddy hole with nothing growing in it. Uh, but they're not silver bullets. Uh, I, so they have a specific diet preference, right? And they, the things that are likely to become really problematic, uh, like let's say, for example, Eurasian watermill foil, which is a really kind of a coarse, wiry stem. They don't like that. Uh, cattails, they're really lousy at eating cattails because cattails have most of their growth up and in the air and carp are really lousy at spending time in the air. Duckweed, um, Duckweed, they might like the flavor of, but these are big animals that are built to graze on the bottom. They aren't really effective at cropping floating stuff from the top like duckweeds, right? So they have a specific diet preference. They like soft stem submerged vegetation, the stuff, the soft stuff growing underwater, which is usually the stuff that I want to see growing, right? So the stuff I actually want in a small coverage in the pond is the stuff that they're going to eat first. And in doing so, they reduce competition against nuisance things. So they can, in the short term at least, they can often make algae problems worse by removing competition for space and nutrients uh, or make invasive plant problems worse. Now, they will eventually get around to eating algae if they have to, if there's nothing else that they actually like to eat left, okay? They're long-lived. So if you stock some grass carp to your pond, you're probably committing to literally decades of their presence and dense stocking will probably preclude the beneficial use of plants. If you stock grass carp, you're probably giving up on the notion that plants might benefit the water quality of your pond. Now that's fine, right? I think that grass carp are an actual useful tool. If you look at a pond and you see that it's choked with a plant that they are likely to like to eat, they're an appropriate response if you understand the trade-offs. Personally, though, I never recommend them as a preventative measure, and I don't recommend them for algae because, once again, they don't like algae and it takes them a while before they will get to it. 
Here is a comprehensive list of all of those chemicals that have been approved for application to the water and uh, as an herbicide. And I'm going to talk in excruciating detail about all of them. No, I'm not because that would be really tiresome. So I will tell you, however, how this table works. Uh, so quickly digest it, um, check it out at your leisure to follow by recording. This first column, I have just the, the chemical name in bold, okay? The chemical name in bold. Now, these chemicals are detailed in an old fact sheet that we had called chemical control of aquatic plants. However, there have been some new chemicals approved for application of the water since those are marked with an asterisk, right? So if you see that star there, that's a new chemical that's not in our old fact sheet. If you want that old fact sheet, write to me, I'll get it to you. It's really good, it's got a lot of great detail accepting those things that have the star next to them. Okay, so here we've got, again, the chemical name of the herbicide. If I call it a contact herbicide, that means it kills the part of the plant that it comes direct contact with. It kills the part of the plant that it touches. Contact herbicides tend to be pretty fast acting. They tend to be good for spot treatments if you can get thorough coverage of your, if you can get your target thoroughly covered, right? So contact herbicides, fast acting, good for spot treatments if you get thorough coverage. However, it only, you're only going to get cover, uh, you're only gonna hit the part of the plant that's exposed, right? So if you have a plant that stores a lot of energy in substantial root systems, uh, that's where a systemic herbicide comes into its own. So a systemic herbicide is taken into the plant's tissue, translocated throughout the plant to kill it internally. Now they tend to be slower acting than contact herbicides, but they also tend to give you a more thorough kill. Regarding selectivity, if I call it broad, it's probably pretty good at killing lots of different things. If I call it selective, it's probably a bit better at killing just a few things. And selective herbicides are often preferred because you can use them to kill nuisance plants and leave those things that you want standing unscathed. Now, selectivity is good. When I say selective here, it's relatively speaking, there are very few that are super selective. Uh, there's almost always going to be some kind of by kill, but um, selective is often a desirable trait. Then, once again, these substances are toxic. So there are often restrictions on the water to follow the application of an herbicide to the water, right? And those restrictions they're usually categorized, right? So they might relate to human uses like swimming or fishing or boating, et cetera. Uh, it might relate to watering animals or livestock or even drawing domestic water for your home. It might relate to irrigating crops or watering greenhouses, all manner of things, right? These are all different water restrictions that might apply to a pond after you've applied a herbicide. If I have offered minimal, uh, and this is in very general terms. If you want the detail, you've got to read the label. You'll find detail on all these product labels, right? If I call a thing minimal, that means it probably has a very short or no waiting period before a water use can resume, <clears throat> or it might touch on very, very few use categories, et cetera, ranging all the way up to extensive, which might have an extremely long waiting period. Sometimes we're talking as much as a year or even sometimes more, or you might actually have to have the water tested uh, to find that the concentration of that chemical has come to a very low uh, concentration before that water use can resume, or it might touch on lots and lots of different categories and be very restrictive for the water use to follow, right? Once again, it'll be detailed on each product's label, so you've got to check that label and select those products accordingly. This table, I have presented all of the contact herbicides that have been approved for aquatic applications, right? And I will, again, not, not dwell too long on this, but I want to tell you how the table works. So in bold, we have the chemical name. And I've picked flumioxacin very deliberately because it's relatively new. Uh, the patent has just expired on flumioxacin, so we are starting to get multiple brands available. So in parentheses, following the chemical name, you will find some commonly available brand names of that chemical, okay? If, if the patent is old enough that there might be more than one brand name available, right? So in parentheses, commonly available brands, that's the, the label you're going to see on the product over the shelf. It'll be called Clipper 
and you have to look at the active ingredient to find the chemical name flumioxacin. Okay, and then following the colon, once again in very general terms, what it's good at killing. And I've selected flumioxacin in particular because <clears throat> this is a relatively new herbicide this, that you might not be familiar with. And it is easily the most effective thing for killing duckweeds, which are these tiny free floating plants um, that float on the surface of the water and often become a serious nuisance. And it's about the only thing that's consistently effective at killing water meal. So if you have problems with duckweeds or water meal, flumioxacin might be one you want to look into. Oh, and every year I get a call from some old guy or seven who says, hey man, where can I get me some Carmex? That stuff is great. It kills everything. Sure enough, it'll probably kill all the trees around your pond too. Don't put Carmex in the water. Carmex has no business being in the water. It is not labeled for aquatic applications. It used to be, but it had so many residual problems and last in the water so long and is carcinogenic that um, it is no longer labeled as safe for aquatic applications. So don't put it in the water. Then here we have the same list for systemic herbicides. Okay, so the same format for this table. In bold, I have the chemical name. In parentheses to follow, a handful of commonly available brand names. And then following the colon, in very general terms, what is good at killing. And of course, again, you're going to find much more detailed terms on the label, but this is a good general overview regarding those herbicides. Have a look if there's any one of these that you want to talk about. If, if you want to discuss any in more detail, we can. Uh, I'm going to point out one on this table as well, because it's a brand new uh, patent for pyroxifen benzyl. Uh, it's still patent protected, so there's only one brand name available. That is, it's sold as the, the, the brand Procellicor. And I've picked it because it is highly selective for water mill foils. The most common watermill foil we have in Ohio is Eurasian watermill foil. Um, any of the other watermill foils are rare to the point that I really doubt you'll ever see them in the state. They're, they're, all the other watermill foils in the state are endangered, right? So if you have watermill foil on your site, it's almost certainly Eurasian watermill foil. And this stuff is really highly selective for watermill foil. So if you've got a problem with Eurasian watermill foil, this is going to kill it. It's going to kill it hard. And it's gonna leave your native plants mostly unscathed. So there you go. If you've got any questions about any details about any of these things, ask them. Otherwise it's time for me to move on. So um, I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but I will point you at least to this aquaplant.tamu.edu site because they've got a nice little kind of online encyclopedia of common aquatic plants. You want to identify the thing correctly before you try to treat it with an herbicide because these herbicides, not every one of them is perfectly effective on every aquatic plant. So if you've got a plant that an herbicide will not kill, you're wasting your money if you buy an herbicide that won't harm that plant. Okay, so check out the nice little encyclopedia they've got at the aquaplant.tamu.edu site. Uh, if you can get to a good identification using their little encyclopedia, every plant is associated with a page that is called management options, and it will tell you which herbicides are good at killing that plant. Now, keep in mind that this site is run out of Texas, right? So they use some funny words for things that I might not ever use. They're also much farther south than we are. So they probably have some problems with plants that we'll never see here. And it's not always that fast to update, right? New herbicides sometimes take a little bit of time to appear on that site. So use it, but no one has some limitations and don't be afraid to call me with some questions or somebody like me who knows something about aquatic plants and can help you. So there you go. You'll find these other resources here. I won't dwell on them, but if you've got questions about them, do ask. Next, let's talk about filamentous green algae. Okay, and so almost always I get those calls and folks say, hey, I got this moss in my pond. Um, moss, there are aquatic mosses. They are not algae and they look quite different. They, uh, moss rarely comes to problems in a pond. Almost always if somebody calls me and says, I got moss, they're talking about a filamentous green algae, right? Grows in very fine filaments, the you know, single cells in these colonies of linear hair-like structures that are called filaments, right? And they grow on the bottom to start the season, and then they often bubble up and float to the surface later in the season and look like these bubbly brownish yellow mats, 
So prevention, manage nutrients. Once again, fertilize that watershed conservatively or not at all, avoiding phosphorus applications within the pond's watershed if at all possible. Manage against Canada geese. Canada geese have a tremendous skill and that is eating your lawn and then floating around gracefully in the pond and crapping all of that lawn into your pond, thereby transferring all of those nutrients from the landscape into the water. Uh, Geese are a tremendous vector to move terrestrial nutrients into the aquatic environment. They move a lot of nutrients from the landscape into the water, okay? Now, on a, on a, a place like Grand Lake St. Mary's or Western Lake Erie, you cannot put enough geese there to make a difference, right? That's a huge volume of water. Geese don't make a difference at all. However, on half an acre in your yard or even four acres in your yard, right, a big population of geese relative to that small volume of water can be a very substantial vector to move nutrients into the water. So manage to make it inhospitable to Canada geese. They are a nuisance to ponds. In order to minimize the recycling of phosphorus from your pond sediments, aerate with diffusers. I guess I'll touch a little bit now on how that works. So in the springtime, well, let's talk first about winter. Winter, your pond is covered with ice, at least in some parts of the state it is. Uh, then uh, spring comes on, the ice melts, and the pond mixes. And it's pretty uniform in temperature, about 39 degrees top to bottom at that point in time. But then spring comes on, air is getting warmer, the sun is staying out for longer and longer, and sunlight hits the surface of the pond and begins to warm that surface water up more than it does the deep water, which is shaded from the sun. Right, And so when water becomes warmer, it becomes less dense, which means at that point, the pond stratifies. It separates into step, separate layers with this warm surface layer, flow, layer floating on the top that if you want to know the technical term for that, that surface water is called the epilimnion, which literally means the surface lake. That bottom water, isolated from the sun, staying cooler because of that, it's heavier. It's literally heavier. So that is the bottom water. It's called the hypolimnion, which literally means the bottom lake, okay? And because those two masses of water are different densities, they do not mix from that point. And then as the summer comes on, that surface water is getting warmer and warmer. It's becoming less and less dense while that bottom water stays isolated and relatively cool. Stratification becomes very stable. So stratification is when it's separated into layers like that, and the warmer that surface is relative to the bottom, the more stable that is, it's resistant to mixing. It cannot mix because those two masses of water are different densities, that bottom being very heavy and the surface being light because the sun is shining on it and keeping it warm. So when that happens, when stratification sets up, as the season progresses into the summer, biological activity is using dissolved oxygen. Right, And that bottom water is cut off from the atmosphere. The surface water is mixing with the atmosphere all the time. Oxygen dissolves into that surface water. The bottom water is isolated. So if you lose oxygen from that bottom water, a quirk of that is that phosphorus dissolves. Phosphorus is going to be the limiting nutrient in, in fresh water in most cases. So you dissolve phosphorus, it comes up into the water column where it can fuel growth of problem algae and things like that. Right. So in order to prevent that, you blow bubbles from the bottom using a diffuser aerator, right? You've got a compressor on the shoreline. The compressor compresses air, pushes it through an airline to a, a, a plate that blows bubbles on the bottom. That plate's called a diffuser. Now, of course, air is made up in part of oxygen. And so some of that oxygen will dissolve across the wall of the bubble into the water, but that's not enough to make a difference. What is important is that bubbles float. So as the bubbles float, they push through that deep water that would ordinarily be cold and isolated, and they push that deep water to the surface. So they force that pond to mix all of the time. And in doing so, as oxygen is dissolving across the whole surface of the pond, it has the potential to get mixed right down to the bottom where it keeps phosphorus from dissolving, where it keeps phosphorus attached to your bottom sediments. We'll talk um, in more detail about a prescription of how to make this happen on your pond later but at least you know the, the why of it now. You also can help prevent or minimize the, the problems you get from filamentous algae by providing competition, right? Tolerate plants in the watershed. Uh, so wetland and terrestrial plants in the land around the pond as surface water is flowing to your pond, 
those plants are allowing that water to infiltrate into the ground. Those plants are growing and consuming nutrients. So those nutrients then don't have the opportunity to get to your pond. And once again, tolerate plants within the pond as well because they're providing competition against algae, which is almost always going to be a nuisance. Treatment, copper, uh, formulae of copper, either copper sulfate or copper chelates. The most common copper chelate brand is called Qtrine. Uh, copper sulfate releases this copper very, very quickly. Uh, copper chelates release their copper a little more slowly, so it stays in effective concentration for longer, okay? Some herbicides are effective on some species of algae, okay? But herbicides tend to be much more expensive than algicides, so it's rare that they're used for treatment of algae unless you have a species of algae that is resistant to copper, okay? And especially in Ohio, if you're going to have copper resistant algae, that tends to be a, a species called Pythophora or a genus called Pythophora. So um, if, you, if you're afraid you might have a Pythophora species, that's when you might want to create one of these cocktails by blending copper products with either Diquat or Endothol in order to kill copper resistant algae. Now, copper resistant algae are not uncommon in Ohio, but they're much less common than the other more common algae. So hopefully you don't encounter this, but if you want, if you're concerned about it, Pythophora has really thick filaments. It's often called horsehair algae because if you were to pluck up some of the filaments of Pythophora and roll them between your fingers, they feel like the hairs of a horse's tail. Warm water caveats apply to treating algae too. Don't treat too much when it's warm or you're risking crashing oxygen and killing fish. Now within Ohio, uh, there's a tropical fish that is being recently used as algae control. This tropical fish called blue tilapia. Uh, unlike grass carp, blue tilapia actually like to eat algae. Um, so uh, you'll see a recipe for stocking tilapia to a pond and they're very prolific, they grow quite quickly. So you stock baby tilapia to your pond in the spring when the water temperature is friendly to tilapia. They begin eating algae, they grow, they might even spawn, they might even reproduce, right? And then uh, giving a burst of baby tilapia to your bass to eat is good for the bass growth as well. But then come winter time, in typical Ohio winters, most or all of them are going to die over the course of a winter. Right? So the best way you, you get some benefit from blue tilapia is you stock them in the spring, you let them conduct their business eating algae throughout the warm months, and then in the fall, when their metabolism slows down, uh, you go out and you commit yourself to harvesting as many as possible when their metabolism slows in the fall. And you can even do that with nets because they get really lethargic. And as long as they're still alive, people actually really like to eat tilapia. Uh, they're a, a lean white protein that, uh, that tastes like the butter you cook it in, right? So people like to eat tilapia. And if you harvest them while they're still alive, have at it and enjoy. I'm going to talk, I think, about harmful algal blooms. Then, I'll, then I'm done talking about green things. So after this, let's plan to break for just a little bit to take some questions live before I get to the, the rest of the stuff. So let's talk quickly about harmful algal blooms. And almost always when we're talking about harmful algal blooms, we're talking about a group of organisms that are called cyanobacteria and technically are not true algae at all. They're commonly called blue-green algae, right? They're green floaty bits that look for all the world like other algae. So they're commonly called algae unless you have a microscope and know how to use it, you wouldn't know that they're not algae. But technically they're a group of, of bacterial organisms, not bacterial that can infect people. They're just kind of free living bacteria out in the wild. Um, let's talk about some common organisms that I see. The most easily, the most common I see in an Ohio ponds is called microcystis. Microcystis can float to the surface and form these kind of bright green surface scums. It almost looks like a fluorescent green poster paint that somebody spilled on your pond. But if you look really closely, you'll see the grainy appearance of this stuff. Uh, in calm situations, it likes to float to the surface where it can steal all the sunlight from everybody else so no, no other green things can grow. But it also can vary its buoyancy. So when the conditions aren't perfect, it'll probably sink to the bottom, or not sink to the bottom, but sink through the, out the water column and, and looks like it disappeared, but it didn't. It's just scattered throughout the water column. 
Planktothrix I see less commonly in ponds, but it's really common to bigger sites like reservoirs, and it might be it might occur in big ponds. The warm blooming species just kind of turn the water kind of a thick green color. Although there is a cold blooming species that looks kind of reddish brown. That's not at all common to ponds, but it is common to reservoirs. So you probably don't need to worry about that one. Phanazominin looks like tiny grass clippings, right? It's, it's colonies, has these filamentous colonies that drift around in the open water that clump together. And if you could like set your lawnmower to, to chop off a 16th inch off of the very tips of your grass blades and throw that in your pond, that's what an Phanazominin looks, bloom looks like. By the way, I should have mentioned this. Planktonic, when I say planktonic, Taxa, that means organisms that float in the open water. So planktonic just means they drift around in the open water. And uh, Dilicospermum uh, is really thick and green and, and just looks really nasty. Benthic means it grows on the bottom. And easily the most common one that I see in Ohio is Oscillatoria. Oscillatoria, it, it, it looks similar to a filamentous green algae, but it is gloppier, <laughs> if, I, if I dare say. It often looks just like a, a brownish glop with a brownish green glop. Sometimes you'll see kind of a turquoise margin to the, the edges of the colony. Uh, and microcera is, is really uh, coarse black filaments. They tend to be short filaments, but they also tend to be very dark compared to the true algae, the green algae. So often if you've got a problem with harmful algal blooms that indicates nutrient enrichment, too much nutrient, especially too much phosphorus. And we call them harmful algal blooms because many species can produce toxins, but variably so. And because they're, they're changing whether or not they're producing toxins all the time, a single point in time test for toxins doesn't tell you much because that might change tomorrow. Meaningful toxin monitoring of a bloom site becomes prohibitively expensive. So I ordinarily don't recommend that you bother testing for toxins, even if you have a harmful algal bloom underway, just because whether or not toxins are there might change tomorrow. So you will give monitoring priority on sites that are used for commercial purposes, like irrigating crops that are going to market. Or if you have, um, if you're drawing water for your own domestic water supply, or if you have public contact, like at a Boy Scout camp. So those kinds of sites where it's important to know, you might have to develop some kind of monitoring program to determine if you have toxins. If it's just your recreational pond there for your recreational use, you probably don't even bother testing for toxins. If you have a bloom underway, you just limit human contact and restrict access by domestic animals. So we talked already about how aeration works, so I don't need to talk about it now, but here we have in essence a recipe for how to, um, how much aeration you need. So here you'll see the maximum depth across the top of this very simple table. And then here you'll have how much you can expect your uh, diffuser to cover by maximum depth. So for example, let's say we have a two acre site with a maximum depth of 12 feet, right? We might need up to four diffuser plates to cover that, up to four, depending. However, a two acre site uh, with 16 feet of depth you probably only need two diffuser plates. And the reason is because as they're blowing bubbles from the bottom, right, those bubbles are spreading out in a little bit of a cone. So the more depth you have, the wider that cone gets, uh, the more opportunity it has to spread out between the bottom and the surface to, to, to move more of that surface water. Okay, so the trade-off is shallow water requires more diffuser plates, but less power. Deep water requires fewer diffuser plates, but more power to drive them because you need to create sufficient pressure at depth to blow bubbles, okay? Uh, when we have this aeration system in place, ordinarily I only recommend warm month only um, operation because the point is to mix the water. So you turn it on in the spring, about the time that uh, stratification is going to set up, you force that water to mix, you run it all the time, all day, every day throughout the warm months. And then the fall, when the water will mix again naturally, you shut it off because you don't need to mix the water when it's mixing itself. So um, that's the essence of if you really want to aerate uh, and you need more detail, feel free to drop a line to me 
or to the Butler Soil and Water Office. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk about that with you as well. Uh, these tend to be late season bloomers when we're talking about harmful algal blooms. So of course that warm water caveat applies. Don't treat too much. Toxins will ordinarily be both dissolved in the water and contained within the organisms themselves. So if you kill the organisms, you won't add new toxins, but they, there won't be any in the organisms any longer. The organisms will rupture and it will release the toxins to the water. So the toxins will all be dissolved. And this is most important if you're worried about drawing water for domestic use because it's a lot easier to filter out the particles of the organisms than it is to remove dissolved toxins. Okay, so just consider that before you treat a harmful algal bloom. If the toxins are present, they will persist for some time after the bloom has been eliminated. And at that point, you really can't know if the toxins are gone unless you test for them because breakdown is variable by site. So apply algicides as necessary with those caveats we've discussed. Uh, typical planktonic blooms are treated with copper or copper chelates. Tricky benthic blooms, I will just kind of give you the, the best way to treat a benthic bloom. Uh, you will treat a, the best way to treat benthic blooms like, link, like microsera or oscillatoria are to hit it first with sodium carbonate peroxyhydrate, which is a very, uh, it's a caustic algicide. It's not very toxic, but it's very caustic. So it burns, right? So that will stress, it will stress those bottom dwelling organisms like oscillatoria. Uh, and then the next day you follow it and hit it with copper. And that's the best way to treat the bottom dwelling blue green algae that are potentially problematic. Now surface scums that are concentrated by breeze are more and more commonly being treated with re repeat treatments of sodium carbonate peroxyhydrate. The advantage of sodium per carbonate peroxyhydrate, it's like hydrogen peroxide, right? So it's not at all very toxic, but it's very caustic. It burns single cell things like like blue-green algae. And it has almost no residual effects in the water. The issue with copper, copper is much cheaper. It tends to get a more thorough kill, um, but it, it can persist and build up in the bottom of the pond over time, okay? So sodium carbonate peroxyhydrate, very chemically reactive. It does not penetrate very deeply. So it's really only effective in very shallow water on the surface, but it has no residual effects. I'm only going to take a couple of minutes because I want to really want to get to the end of this presentation as quickly as I can. But are there any quick questions before I start talking about animals and ponds? Hearing none, let's talk about the animals and ponds. Again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions at any point in time if you've got some. I'd really rather interact with people than, than preach. So let's talk about fisheries management. The essence of the nature of a pond is that it's small, right? And so it has very limited diversity of habitat. So in Lake Erie, you've got sand beaches, you've got rocky shorelines, you've got places with lots of vegetation, you've got places with no vegetation, you've got gravel bars, all of this stuff, right? And so you've got this huge volume of water, which with a tremendous diversity of habitat, so fish can spread out and do things differently. A pond is not like that, right? You've got a relatively small volume of water, a relatively uniform habitat. So you cannot expect the pond to behave like Lake Erie in supporting this crazy diverse fishery, okay? Small areas will probably need really active management depending upon how productive each pond is. And to, to be successful in managing a pond fishery, keep it extremely simple. Usually we're only talking about a single level of interaction between one or a couple uh, species being forced to behave as the prey in this scenario, and one species being forced to, to behave as the top predator. Within our region, the classic, the tried and true, the one that's most studied and the one that's most easiest to manage, to, is the easiest to manage, is this combination of largemouth bass as your top predator and bluegill as your prey fish. And channel catfish are weird enough and do things differently and they don't really get in the way of the other two. So you can add channel catfish to that mix if you like to catch an occasional catfish. Somebody want to ask a question quickly? Okay, so alternative species are not necessarily appropriate for the pond novice. Now there, there are some possibilities for alternative species. If you've got questions about alternative species, feel free to ask them. 
but for the most part, I'm just going to talk about what's common and most easy to manage. So here we've got the stocking strategy. Uh, you can see here we've got largemouth bass and bluegill. Largemouth bass, again, our top predator and bluegill being forced to be our prey. We can add channel catfish if we'd like. Uh, also, there is a close relative of bluegill sunfish, the red ear sunfish that is sometimes used because red ear sunfish get a bit bigger. They like to eat snails. So if you've got a snail problem, they help suppress snails. And you can either use bluegill alone or in combination with red ear sunfish or red ear sunfish alone if you'd like. Okay. But what I want you to notice here, these are the number to stock to a new pond per acre. What we have here is the number of top predators. You'll note is one top predator to every five prey fish. And that's a pretty typical way to get a pond started. Five prey fish to every one predator, right? And you can see that these sizes are relatively small. Now, if you want to add catfish to the mix because they get big and, and are more predatory than otherwise, you also treat them the same way you would largemouth bass. Now, the best way to do, so when, when the water is cold, metabolism of fish is low, so they're less prone to stress. So you want to stock them when the water is cold. And the best time to do that is the fall, because when the fall is cool and getting colder, that means diseases of fish are also becoming less active. So they're less prone to stress, they're less prone to disease when you stock your game fish in the fall, right? But the issue is that surviving that first winter is usually a matter of how much fat they've been able to put on before they go into that winter. So the best way to stock a new pond is to stock with flat head, fathead minnows in the springtime with spawning habitat. Fathead minnows are cavity nesters, right? So you put like a bunch of old chipping pallets in the pond, you put a bunch of fathead minnows in the pond, they will spawn. They will make lots of babies. They'll probably spawn more than once. And then in the fall, you'll put in your game fish, right? And the game fish they need to fatten up to survive that first winter. Well, all those tiny baby fathead minnows are available to help those new small game fish fatten up and get through that first winter. And then as the game fish grow, especially the largemouth bass, they'll get big enough to eat the adult fathead minnows too. Fathead minnows will probably eventually disappear from the system, but it's a great way to jumpstart it. Minnows in the spring, followed by your game fish in the fall. That's how you start a pond. Do you get to have both lots of fish and big fish? at the same time, hmm, how about you get to have both trophy bluegill and trophy largemouth bass at the same time when we're talking about a self-sustaining fishery where the fish are reproducing in order to sustain themselves? Not likely, okay? And that's simply because fish growth is plastic. When you have fish with plenty to eat, they grow really big. When fish don't have enough to eat, uh, they maintain their, their, their baseline metabolism but they sacrifice growth when there's not enough to eat, right? So the bottom line is if you have lots of either one species or the other, you, whichever you have got lots of is creating too much competition among themselves. And so they don't grow as well because there's not enough food, as much food to go around. So the trade-off is you get to either have lots of fish or you, you get to have big fish if you have few fish. Few fish leads to big fish, lots of fish leads to small fish. Use that very simple principle to manage the fishery, okay? And there are some common management strategies. Do nothing almost always results in bad fishing, so do something. Uh, balance where you have like a nice mix of lots of different size classes across both species. It sounds like a really nice option, but it's actually pretty difficult to manage that way. It's like walking a tightrope. Much easier to manage is either for the big bluegill strategy, which is really great for families and kids, right? And you maintain this by not harvesting many bass. You allow those bass to overpopulate. You have lots and lots of, of small bass all the time, always hungry, always competing against each other so they never get big, but they eat lots and lots of baby bluegill. So the few bluegill that get through that gauntlet have less competition and they get really big. That's the big bluegill strategy. It's a great strategy for families because little bass are always willing to take a hook you can harvest an occasional big bluegill. There'll be more big bluegill there and uh, kids feel like they've won dinner for the evening, right? And it produces lots of catchable fish because you're putting more of the energy lower in the food pyramid, right? So lots of catchable fish. However, if you're a fishing purist, if you're really into fishing, you might not want to catch tiny bass and an occasional big bluegill all day. So the big bass strategies really for those purists. 
uh, not very good for families because it produces very few catchable fish. And you maintain this by retaining lots of small bluegill. So they overpopulate, they don't grow very quickly, they never get big, and you selectively harvest bass so that you have the few remaining, no competition among each other, and they get really big, okay? And this puts all of the energy at the top of our food pyramid. It puts all of our energy at the tiger level, right? And look out at the landscape. How many deer do you see? Lots of deer, right? And so that's this kind of strategy. You are, you, you are making deer easily available uh, as opposed to this one where we are looking at the landscape again. How many tigers do you see? Not many, right? So that's this bottom strategy. It produces very few catchable fish. But again, if you're a purist and you want those trophy bass, that might be the only one you tolerate. Fish kills. I'm going to talk really quickly about fish kills. Uh, um, the essence is it's almost always caused by a low oxygen event. Oxygen crashes for some reason, fish suffocate. Following the event, determine why and mitigate it against the future. If you have to restock because you lost too many fish, allow time for the pond to recover and don't stock again until the water is cool. So some scenarios. Um, low oxygen stress can be induced if you've got too much green stuff growing or if you kill too much vegetation in the warm months. Uh, too much green stuff growing, you have low oxygen stress every night when photosynthesis shuts down where you can stress and kill fish, right? So this low oxygen stress, you minimize risks from that by tolerating a modest coverage of healthy plants, as we've discussed already. If you've got to treat plants, treat as early and as conservatively in the season as possible and aerate, as we've discussed, to keep oxygen concentrations at good levels throughout the, the warm months. Classic summer kill, okay? So the classic summer kill, we talked about a stratified pond and we talked about the fact that the deep water loses oxygen as the season progresses. So a classic summer kill happens when you've got this strongly stratified pond uh, if you're not aerating, right? And you've got this thick layer, this thick bottom layer, the hypolimnion is thick and has no oxygen. Well, along comes this late summer thunderstorm, late summer thunderstorm drops a whole lot of cold water on the surface. Suddenly that surface water that had oxygen becomes very heavy because that, that storm water, that, that rain water is very cold. It forces the pond to mix prematurely so that no oxygen water on the bottom is stirred up and it drops the oxygen throughout to the point that it kills fish. It's often a very aggressive event when that happens. So if that pond mixes prematurely in the summertime, you'll often see some of the bottom sediment stirred up and the pond will kind of turn a, a grayish black because you've mixed some of the mud off the bottom. And that can kill fish. That's the classic summer kill scenario, right? So to minimize the risk of that, if you're building a new pond, build it to allow as much wind energy going into the pond as possible to keep that pond better mixed naturally so it doesn't stratify strongly. Uh, and you do that by aligning the skinny axis, the long axis of the pond in line with the prevailing winds. You don't tolerate trees to the west of the pond where they will block prevailing winds, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff is good. And the aerate throughout the warm months so that you don't stratify if at all possible. Classic winter kill happens when you have ice accumulation on the pond. Ice accumulation on the pond will cut off the atmosphere, right? Now the water is cold in the winter time, so metabolism of everybody is much lower. They're using less oxygen, but they still need some oxygen. So in the winter time, you seal that pond with ice, it cuts off the atmosphere. Still, if the sunlight is shining through the ice, the green stuff, there's not as much green stuff there, but there is some that green stuff is still photosynthesizing and providing enough oxygen to get through that time. Problem happens if that ice becomes thick and opaque or if you accumulate snow on the ice so there's no, there's no sunlight penetration. At that point, you've cut off the atmosphere with the ice, you've cut off photosynthesis by shading it with snow, oxygen production stops and you begin to use oxygen from that point forward. And if that goes on long enough, oxygen will get really critically low and you have a winter kill, which tends to be a very serious event, more, more serious usually than summer kill, okay? So to, to fix that, you can either shovel snow from about a quarter of the pond to allow some sunlight penetration and photosynthesis, or you can repurpose your aerators. You'll move your aerators out of the deep water and put them in the shallow water to eat a hole in your ice. 
Or if you've got a big pond, you might actually have it set up so several are in the deep water and one is in the shallower water. Then you can turn off the deep ones in the winter time and use that shallow one again to erode hole in, in the ice to allow some exchange with the atmosphere, but not both. Right, because if you're deliberately eating holes in your ice, I don't want to catch you walking around out there with a shovel because that's just not safe. Pick one. Uh, now that said, if you've got a quarter acre pond, I might visit you with a shovel in the winter time. If you've got five acres of pond, man, I'm, I'm not coming over with a shovel because that's a lot of stuff to be shoveling. Tolerate moderate coverage of vegetation, but not too much and avoid large herbicide treatments late in the season because if those plants are still decomposing when it's sealed with ice, they are a serious demand for oxygen. So low oxygen stress will affect all species, although a little bit differently. So if you have a low oxygen fish kill, you're gonna notice that all the different species there are dying. Spawning is hard work. I often get calls in the spawning season because they saw a handful of bluegill or bass dead. Spawning is hard work is stressful. The older fish are probably going to die when they spawn. So very often, if you see only one species dying about the time they're spawning, they're probably just succumbing to stress. That's natural. Eventually, they got to die. We all do, unfortunately. Substantial kills resulting from disease are relatively uncommon and, depending on the disease, may only affect a single species. Substantial kills from toxic events. A lot of people are afraid that they've got some kind of poison going into their pond. I will tell you that Fish kills from toxic events are downright rare to ponds. They will affect all species, albeit differently. However, smaller fish are going to be more susceptible to poisons than larger fish. So you're likely to see the small fish dying first if it actually is a toxic event. Wild aquatic organisms, I sometimes get calls about these guys, right? And I don't mind them so much. Uh, sometimes you'll see, uh, you'll see a bloom of freshwater jellyfish or uh, native mussels. If I ever see a native mussel in a pond, it's almost always the giant floater, which can get really big. Or bryozoans, which are these brain-like blobs that, some, that are uh, affectionately called moss animals. Um, I don't worry about these. Some people call, call me about them. I think they're cool when they occur. And almost always if they occur, that's a good sign because that means you've got oxygen that can support them. And then general pond and lake management is such a generic catch-all category that there's nothing really I can say about it. So we've arrived at the end. I'm eager to take your questions, but the real point of this slide is that I like to look at pictures of myself with fish. And now you get to as well, congratulations. And here's where you can reach me, but that's much less exciting than pictures of fish. So do you have any questions? Hope there was something useful in there for you guys. Well, I guess I realized uh, how much I don't know. And uh, I'm Bill, this is Bill Hoblitz. Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, live in Westchester. And I was wondering uh, how would you uh, interview a pond management company to be able to come in and take care of your ponds correctly? Uh, this That's is enough information just to kind of give you just a, a real idea of how much you don't know. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a really hard question. And unless you are well-versed yourself and doing the work yourself, I'm, I'm, I would need to give that some real thought. I suppose one of the things that is a bit of a pet peeve of mine is that pond management companies often like to do the easy thing and they just like to treat to kill all plants, which uh, you can manage upon that way. You can manage upon that way very successfully, but um, the water quality of the pond is going to be relatively artificial if you do it that way. So I, I might start by just asking about options regarding plant management, and if there are any scenarios they would recommend where you tolerate native plants or, or what strategies they might use in order to encourage a small coverage of native plants and, and um, manage it successfully to be a small coverage. Now that's, um, I'm not sure though, you'd probably have to have some savvy to evaluate the answer they gave you. No, that's uh, good. It'd be extremely difficult to kind of evaluate your, you, you wonder if they're, they could 
very easily blow smoke at this point and you wouldn't really have a good idea. Right. So what, I mean, one of the things I recommend is to work with your soil and water office because they often know the local contractors and, um, or you can even ask me now. I don't, because I'm statewide, I can't have a comprehensive knowledge of everybody conducting business in the state. But if I hear negative reports, I would warn you against that before you, you commit to something bad. You can't That's give us, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. You can't give somebody a positive recommendation, but you could say, if you mention something you say, well, maybe you might want to consider looking further or something. Yeah, so that'd be kind of like an under the table recommendation. <laughs> I under, understand. Right, I, I will say that most of those who are dedicated to pond management in Ohio, right? The big companies that do only pond management do so because they know it really well. They get, there's a lot of demand for their time. So they travel the state to do it specifically. If you're going to find problems with people who don't really know what they're doing with ponds is often in, in like landscape companies are doing pond management on the side. Now that's not to say that they're all bad at that because there's some that are very good at that. But if there are going to be problems, it's likely to be with those, those companies that are not specialists. I see, that helps. Great. Thank you. Do you mind if I call you a man named Sue? <laughs> yeah, I don't know a, if man, a man named Sue, that's right. <laughs> I'm on her computer. Okay. <laughs> don't, that's an old Johnny Cash song. I know it is. <laughs> I'm old. I'm old enough to know that. Trust me. Excellent. Great questions. Very thought, thoughtful questions. Right. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Bill. If you like, uh, Mr. Bragg said, uh, if you would like to get in touch with us. At some point, um, I, I'd be happy to even come out to your property and do a visit and just see if there's anything that I, I see that catches my eye that looks like it could be an issue or it could not be an issue. And we can kind of help get you pointed in the right direction. That'd be helpful. That would really be helpful. I, I, I uh, kind of part, I, kind of work underneath Ray Bowman there. And we just uh, kind of have a series of ponds in our area. And, uh, we probably would probably entertain that idea. See if you'd come out. Yeah, and I, yeah I, I think I've actually talked to Ray in the past. I see quite a few uh, familiar names on here and the offer stands to everybody. I, I'd be happy to come out. Um, if, you, if you want to get in contact with us, really the best uh, way is to just call our office and we can set up an appointment with you. Um, our line to the office, it's 513-887-3720 if you ever want to give us a call. I think your information's on the email, isn't it? Your contact yeah. information? Yep. All right. Yep. You can email me, call me directly. It's on there as well. All right. Take advantage of Brady, right? It, he's got some savvy and he's close. I, I also, um, I tra in ordinary times, I travel the state and do pond visits all the time. I often do them in, in collaboration, right? Well, I often meet a, a soil and water guy on site. Uh, I'm happy to do that as well when times are returning a little more to normal. My travel is restricted through June um, and it, it might be, well, allegedly, it might be loosening up even before then, depending upon how vaccinations and things go. but. In ordinary times, I'm also happy to visit, but it sometimes takes more time because I am statewide and it, I've got to work it into my schedule. Anything else? Me. Hey. No, it's been very interesting. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I really stay in touch if I can assist with anything. Go ahead, a person whose name appears to be Curtis, but doesn't look like I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Joy, and I apologize that we uh, got here late, but um, do you have any suggestions for how to keep snapping turtles out of your pond? So snapping turtles, that's an interesting issue. Uh, I sometimes get questions about snappers. Now, I don't worry about snappers. I think they're really cool. You know, they're, they're big animals. They, uh, they, they, 
in the water, they're not very aggressive. Uh, they're much more aggressive on land when they're feeling more intimidated by you. That's when you're more likely to lose a digit, right? But um, they, um, they're they much less problematic than most people think. It would take a really excessive population of snapping turtles to effectively damage a fish population. They will eat fish, but they're not nearly as good at doing all as fish. Right? So most of the time they're eating dead stuff, stuff that's easy to catch. They're not as effective predators as fish are on fish. So it's a rare situation where snapping turtles create a problem for a pond fishery. Now a lot, the females will um, dig to uh, form nests, but those nests are relatively shallow and superficial. So it's really unlikely that they would even damage a dam, but they might they might create some pits around the pond that you've got to be mindful for. So turtles can be trapped, but they have to be trapped following Division of Wildlife regulations. So check those out those regulations. If you really want to, uh, the best thing you can do is to trap them. Otherwise, know that they're, they're not as damaging to ponds as most people think they are. Yeah, they don't. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. They're not really damaging the pond as much as, you know, we catch them when we'd really like to be catching other fish. We tend to be catching the big turtles. It's a hell of a fight though, isn't it? Yeah, yes it is. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so they, they're not really effective hunters. So if you're fishing with bait that is stationary, you're much more likely to catch them than if you're moving, moving a lure for example. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, Joy, just to follow up with that, um, there is a list of, they're like DNR approved, uh, like nuisance wildlife trappers. Um, it's listed by county. So there's some that are local to Butler County. It's everything from a guy who just enjoys trapping to a company that specializes in it. Um, and if you just go to Google and type in Ohio nuisance wildlife trappers, they, there's several people on that list locally that could probably help you out. Okay, thank you. And lots of people yes, like the soup too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I have a few family members that <laughs> do that. <laughs> Send cool. them my way. <laughs> Uh, this is Ray Bowman. Uh, Georgie, can you uh, comment on control of uh, of uh, water rats? Are you talking about muskrats? Muskrats, yes. Same thing, right? Uh, trap them. Now, muskrats are particularly muskrats are problematic on ponds, especially ponds that have some kind of dam or dike, right? Because if they get into the engineered earth. Right? If they get into that engineered core that's compacted, they can compromise the, the, the pond to the point that it can cause catastrophic failure. Right, So you, you want to be mindful to make sure that there are no muskrats burrowing into a dam. Uh, if you're going to tolerate cattails, which some crazy people want to tolerate cattails, I'm fine with that if you are really strict about managing them and not allowing them to spread. If you're gonna, you want to keep the the tall vegetation like cattails that muskrats like away from your dam, right? If you're going to tolerate any cattails, they should not be anywhere close to a dam because that's more likely to put the, the muskrat activity at the dam, right? So if you're going to tolerate any tall standing vegetation, no tall standing vegetation near to the dam. If muskrats are a problem, trap, right? That's, uh, you can contract trappers or trap yourself within season. The other issue, so um, muskrats also, they, they don't like places where they can't dig. So a lot of people, if, if you like this look, or if you just simply want the protection, riprap, which is rock, right? Sizable rock, you can armor the shoreline with rock to about two feet deep. That makes the place very inhospitable to muskrats. So you're much less likely to have muskrat populations if you've riprapped the shoreline. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Anything else? Well, 
if there's nothing else, thanks for your time. I really hope you got something useful from this. You're always welcome to drop me a line with your pond questions. That's like my job and I actually like my job. And uh, I'll sit here until all of your heads disappear. But other than that, I'm calling it a night. Thank you very much. And uh, again, this is recorded. So I'm gonna put it on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully tonight. And uh, it'll be there for as long as YouTube exists for your reference. And then I'll send a follow-up email with some other resources, but thanks for everybody attending tonight and look to see you at our events in the future. Well, thanks to both of you for your time. Appreciate My pleasure. it. Thank you for listening. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. I'm going to share the screen. And uh, we were at a pond. This is, I would probably put it in the lake category, actually. Um, it's not really sure. What, it's something that I've never seen before. Okay. I mean, so, you're just. If you can see. Yeah. Can you see that? So. I'm guessing that it's a species of water primrose. Okay. There are lots of water primroses. Uh, there is one that is unfortunately invading pretty aggressively in your area called creeping water primrose. Now, creeping water primrose is almost impossible to tell from the other ones until it flowers out. But if this, I'm thinking, is a species, almost certainly a species of water primrose. Okay. And uh, hold on a second. Let me see if I can find. Uh, so I think I'm not certain, but I think it responds pretty uh, well to glyphosate. The problem is glyphosate doesn't uh, penetrate the water very well. So you really need to hit, you can only hit the terrestrial stuff with glyphosate. Give me just a moment and I'll see if I can find a good herbicide treatment. for water primroses. So we have, we have a number of native water primroses. The most common one is marsh seed box. Um, but again, when it flowers out, you 